it was uh, I have been having so many meetings, Paul. I don't even remember how we checked in. So do we do roll call or not? <laughs> well, yes, we'll do uh, welcome and introductions. And, and uh, I think Brenda typically has been doing the roll call here for attendance. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead and proceed with that then, Paul. Um, All right. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I will call off the names of everyone that I can see is on attendance. And then if I do not call, you do not have to say here. Um, if I do not call your name, let me know. So, um, and I'm not going to use titles. I'll just use your name. Joe Pichoneri, Sean Van Gordon, Pete Sorensen, Joe Burney, Lucy Vinnis, Ray Smith, Caitlin Vargas, Carl Yeh, Sasha Vartanian, uh, Ke Kelly Clark. You do not have to say here. Um, if I do not call your name, let me know. So, uh, can, can folks turn your microphones off, please, so we can have a quality meeting? Sean Van Gordon, Pete Sorensen, Joe Bernie, Lucy Bennett, Ray Smith, Caitlin Vargas, Carl Yeh, Sasha Vartanian. It's this person. Uh, Kelly Clark. Sorry. Um, could the callers that are on the phone mute yourself because... I'm being played back through your microphone. We have four callers. Can you mute them? Paul, well, looks like we have two more callers that have our microphones on. Brenda, can you hear me? Okay, now I think we're back. Okay, I'm going to pick up where I left off. Uh, Rachel Dorfman, Sid Schultz, Dan Collister, and Ellen Courier, Emma Newman, Andrew Martin, Reed Dunbar, Tom Boyat, Bill Johnston, Cosette Reese, Neil Moyer, and Tom Schwetz, I see, just joined us. Thank you, get uh, Ann Heath. And there are three callers on the phone that I cannot identify. So if you can identify yourself, that would be great. Neil Ladati, City of Springfield. I'm John Favel of Eugene. Bob Zake with Better Eugene Springfield Transportation. I think that's it. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Oh, okay. And again, if okay. folks can make sure that their microphones are turned off, we will be able to maintain a, a better quality meeting that way. Unless you, unless of course it's time for you to speak. Uh, welcome, Betty. I just saw Betty show show up. Um. So. I have called a meeting to order. We've done roll call, and I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the November fifth MPC meeting minutes. So moved. Moved and Second. seconded by moved by Joe Bernie, seconded by Pete Sorensen. Thank you guys. Uh, all in favor, I guess, can signal signify by a hand wave. Or um, I, I guess it might be easier, folks, if if we'll assume everybody's a yes. If someone is a no, to please speak up. All right, so it's a unanimous. Um, moving on, is there Anyone from the audience would like to make comments, anyone wishing to make a comment is uh, asked to uh, keep their comments limited to three minutes. And if so, please shout out. Chair. Yes. Uh, a couple of things. I'm going to start the recording real quick. Oh, this and conference will now be recorded. Brenda has a comment and then Rob Zako has indicated he would like to speak. Okay. Do you want me to go in reverse just a little bit to indicate how the minutes vote was so it's recorded. 
Uh, no, I think we're fine. We have it unanimous. We have it recorded here. Okay, sounds good. Uh, go ahead, Brenda. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just want to note that this meeting will be the last meeting for Lane County Commissioner Pete Sorensen and LTD Board Member Carl Yeh. And I just wanted to thank them for their service. Uh, serving on the MPC is important, and it's also um, a, a pretty big a responsibility for our region. And I really appreciate the time and the effort uh, and all of the really great discussions that both of them have participated in over the past year. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you. We got thumbs up and clapping, honest. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Uh, is there a moment of uh, of uh, attribution for Councillor Taylor? And she and I have overlapped for 24 years as county commissioner and city councillor. Uh, isn't this uh, your last meeting too, Betty? Is it? Yeah, I think so. Yes, well, it I is. I don't know oh, the, the terms. I don't know the terms of the city. Counselor, so maybe it goes into the next MPC me. I didn't oh. know. Only oh, till January 6th. Well, well Betty, this is the last one. That, that, that'd be one more for Counselor Taylor. Yeah, one yeah, more. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just want to say something nice about MPC and my service on it. Number one, it's been a really great honor to be appointed to the MPC by the Board of Commissioners. And it's been, a, you know, I've done it several times in the course of my terms. And I uh, really have enjoyed it. It's always been um, educational to me. And I hope that the discussion that myself have, have added to the, uh, to the mix. Uh, and it's been a pleasure serving with all of you. And I especially want to do a shout out to the staff, uh, not just Lane County staff or, or Eugene or Springfield, but the LCOG staff that has uh, made it possible for this committee to ensure compliance with uh, federal uh, requirements on how federal transportation dollars are spent in the metropolitan area. And it's been a privilege. Thank you. I just want to chime in because I missed your moment a little bit earlier. I got just away and I also want to thank the commissioner and thank Carl and thank uh, our esteemed city councilor Betty Taylor for serving on this committee. It is a, it's your contributions have been really, I think, very constructive and helpful to us all. And I really enjoyed this opportunity with you on this committee. So thank you, thank you all, and uh, good luck in the next chapter. Uh, Chair Fisher and Ari, if if, you, if it's okay for me to talk really briefly, oh, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to say thank you very much for the kind words, uh, Mayor Venice, and uh, I just also want to thank Brenda uh, and Paul for your for your kind words too. And it's been great working with uh, uh, Commissioner Sorensen and uh, Councillor Taylor. I, I do want to say though, you may not have gotten rid of me quite yet because uh, I will be continuing to serve. And I think um, LTD until a replacement can be found for me on the board. Um, but I uh, and it's quite possible I will be continuing to. Uh, be at these meetings in the future. So please don't be surprised if I re am resurrected in January. So thank you very much. So I guess that's a please not do not mute you. <laughs> so don't. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I think we're met ready to move on. Brenda, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yes. I, wow. Are there any other announcements from MPC members? Well, Pete's got one. Uh, thank you, um, uh, and, and thanks for all the kind words. Uh, but I, w I did want to make an announcement that uh, is relevant to uh, my successor on the MPC, and that is that uh, Commissioner Bernie and the uh, and the new commissioner, Commissioner uh, uh, Trigger. And the other members of the Lane County Board of Commissioners will be meeting on January 5 and 6 to discuss the appointments of, of uh, commissioners to various boards and commissions. And that uh, uh, historically, we haven't always gotten that done. I should say the board. The board has. Oh. Oh.
Commissioner Sorensen, your video and audio has frozen I've up. I've always gotten that done in time to meet the January MPC meeting. Unlike uh, Mr. You can continue. Uh, oh, you can't hear me. In and out, Commissioner. Can't you hear me? We can now. Ah, okay. You can now. Well, anyway, uh, I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, sometimes the board doesn't get that decision made right away in early January. But uh, since Commissioner Bernie's here, I'm sure he will be uh, hot on the trail to make sure that there's a successor for me uh, at that MPC meeting, as it is very important to have the uh, Board of Commissioners rep fully represented at that uh, January meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pete. Um, so go ahead, Paul. I think you were in the middle of something there. Uh, no, Chair. Uh, if there's no more announcements from MPC members, the only other thing I would note would be for the next agenda item. I have an advance notification from Dr. Zako that he may want to speak this morning. That's, that was what he indicated to me. So if he still wishes to, that's the only indication and I have a public comment so far. Okay, thank you. Do you still wish to speak, sir? Yes, briefly. Thank you. Okay, uh, go right my ahead. name is, you can hear me now? Yes, we can. My name is Rob Zake. I'm Executive Director of Better Eugene Springfield Transportation. And I just want to make some brief comments about your item 6A, the RTP objectives. Uh, first, I want to thank you for your discussion last month discussing the goals and adding a climate change uh, not a climate change goal, but language to one of the goals regarding climate change. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, second, um, in general, the objectives that are before you today look great, and I won't make any detailed comments. Um, there's a lot of really good language in there. Uh, I would call to your attention that there's some language that's new compared to the existing plan, um, more about equity, more about safety, more about climate change, uh, more about options, and that is all good. Um, that said, uh, you understand that we live in a time of limited resources and we're not going to be able to do everything we want to do. Um, not for today, but down the road, you might ask yourself, suppose that Congressman DeFazio were to become head of the, well, he is, head of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee and were to come to you in January and say, I can get you $50 million. What do you want to spend it on? Uh, and I think that that's where the rubber really meets the road. You can't go back to them and say, we want to do 28 different things. You're going to have to have priorities of what's really important to you. Uh, not a discussion for today, but something to keep in mind. Uh, lastly, just a note, at the end of the uh, cover memo for this agenda item, it talks about public input. And it says, community outreach will continue and include online open houses, mailings, meetings with key partners and community groups. Um, I'm not actually aware that that's been happening yet, and it's probably fine if it hasn't. This is still early that you're just developing draft language, uh, but we would anticipate that as you get more firm language that there will be opportunities for public comment. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Paul, do you have anybody else? Chair. Oh, someone wanted to speak. I'm a caller who also wants to make a public comment. Okay, okay. we have, uh, Paul, we have one more. And sir, go ahead and identify yourself and and you're welcome to speak for three minutes. Yes, well, my name is John Eville. I'm with the uh, Northeast Neighbors Neighborhood Association. One of the items you'll be considering today is the amendment that would allow construction to path along the east side of North Delta Highway. And I wanted to speak about why that's so important to us. It's always been the main route that people use, especially cyclists, going down to connect with the bike paths and is going to become even more intensely used because it's an area of very rapid development. Uh, in the last three years, just north of where that path would go in, 340 apartment units uh, were approved and are being constructed, and about 250 single family residences. Uh, and the uh, next step is the development company is 
and to add another 612 apartment units along North Delta Highway immediately north of where that path would go in. The reason the path is needed is that North Delta Highway narrows dramatically as it comes up and approaches Ayers Road so that the bike lane is about two feet wide. There is no pedestrian pathway, and it is a very, very dangerous uh, uh, route for cyclists to take. Obviously, it's going to become even more used as development continues, and so shifting everything to the east side and making that the main artery being used by cyclists and pedestrians would be a terrific safety measure. So we are very, very much hoping that you endorse that. Thank you. Chair, if I may. Go ahead. Uh, John, the, the speaker that just spoke, could you please, for the record, spell your last name? Sure. F as in Frank, A, V as in Victor, I, L, L, E. Thank you, sir. You bet. Thank you, sir. Do I have any uh, more speakers in queue, Paul? Uh, uh, let me speaker that just spoke. Could you please, for the record, spell your last name? Sure. So, so if all callers would please mute their microphone. Chair, I have muted that speaker again, um, and I don't see anybody else that wishes to speak at this time. Okay. And I, I show a uh, caller Ken with his microphone still on, and I'm not sure if that if we know that person or if that's possibly even Brenda. Um, uh, all right, we're. I think we're okay now. Okay, thank you. Uh, so moving on to items, uh, that's it for public comments. Is that all we have, Paul? As far as you know. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So let's move on to item number six A. Chair, I have asked Kelly Clark to take the lead on the discussion on this one today. Kelly? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you all. So the agenda item this is specific to is discussing and receiving your feedback and direction on our regional transportation plan objectives. And this is what Mr. Zako had referred to in his public comment. Um, so staff have uh, drafted objectives presented in the cover memo to support the goals that USMPC supported during our November meeting. And those goals, as just as a reminder, are transportation choices, safety, security, and resiliency, healthy people and environment, equity, uh, economic vitality, reliability and efficiency, and system asset preservation. And so the objectives we define as intermediate points that will help fulfill those overall goals. And so another way to think about this is that there are strategies or tools that we can utilize over the next 20 years plus horizon to work towards our draft goals. Uh, the RTP projects, programs, and action items that we develop in upcoming phases of this project will, will further define how we actually achieve these objectives. Um, and so just for a little bit of background, the, back, the, object, the draft objectives that we have here come from our review of your local plans, um, best practices seen in other MPO plans, and what we've heard from the community so far through this and other planning efforts. Uh, we've presented them in two different ways. First, the cover memo has them in a table format, um, listing the objectives and then an indication of which goals they are most applicable to um, supporting. And then the second is an attachment to the cover memo um, as a draft of the goals with the supporting objectives listed below. And the purpose of this is because we recognize that in many cases, one of the objectives will work towards fulfilling more than one goal. And we really wanted to highlight that. So none of the goals or the draft objectives are prioritized in any way, and they will not be prioritized in the final um, document either. Um, and just to comment on Mr. Zeko's question about public um, outreach, we are continuing to work on public outreach. The online open house will be launched next week and we will send you an update of that once it's live. Um, we are scheduling meetings with key partners and community groups um, currently. And um, with that, I would like to open this topic up for discussion and your feedback. Is there anybody wishing to speak? I see uh, 
Mayor Bennis, you have your hand up. Go for it. Yes, th thank you, uh, Kelly. Uh, just a, uh, a quick question. You mentioned uh, it was clear in the document. These are none of these objectives are prioritized, and they won't be prioritized. That sort of is that standard. I mean, is there a reason for that? Just uh, thinking of of uh, Rob Zico's, that, you know, it, it make it faster for us to respond to certain things if we knew what our priorities were. Just curious about that process. Sure. We sure. heard from. Oh, Paul, sorry. No, go ahead, Kelly. So we've heard from MPC that um, each of the goals are equally important, and we don't want to set that standard for prioritization at the goal level. Um, since the objectives are so complementary in fulfilling many of the goals, we took that, that same approach to the objectives as well. The other thing I might add, if I may, is, is to keep in mind that this is a 24-year horizon on the uh, long-range plan. And for that reason, uh, we have a toolbox of objectives that may be used at any point during that horizon to draw from, depending on funding availability, federal requirements changing, local priorities changing. And, and while the RTP is updated every four to five years, and you can do things in those updates, as Dr. Zako mentioned earlier, like add new objectives, which add to our toolbox because of those changing priorities. Uh, we don't necessarily want to, within what's supposed to be a very long range plan, prioritize them within the document itself. We, we use them in a point of time uh, to do things like program the money through the MTIP and take on other activities of the MPO. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. And thank you for refreshing my memory that that's how we talked about this last time. Okay. Okay, I, mine went silent. I don't know if it's me or if it's nobody speaking. I haven't heard anyone. Is there any further questions for Kelly? Paul, can you hear me? Yes, Chair, and I don't see okay. any other comments or questions being raised on screen or in the chat box. Okay, thank you. I just was had nothing but crickets and I was kind of scared, <laughs> technically speaking here. <laughs> okay, sounds wonderful. Uh, Chair, uh, Chair, uh, Carl, Carl Ye is raising his hand, I believe. Oh, Chair, I, just, I didn't know we were at the point where um, if I want to make sure people were able to ask questions first. But if you're ready for comments, I, I'd like to make a brief comment. I, well, I'm not sure if Kelly, Kelly, are you done with your presentation or um, do you want to take questions afterwards or comments afterwards? I'm finished and I'm happy to take comments okay. and questions. That's great. Let's go into some dialogue and that's where we get things done. Go ahead, Carl. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much, Kelly, for that presentation. I just want to say I, I, I think these objectives are excellent. Uh, they really coincide with a lot of the things that a Lane Transit District is working on. Uh, we will be likely incorporating a lot of these in our strategic plans. Um, and actually, if you look at all of these objectives, um, every one of them really touch on, on uh, have some way to touch off to transit. So, so great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Do I have any more comments from anyone else? Well, that's excellent. Okay, with the I, I reiterate. Oh, go ahead, Mayor Smith. I I just want to shortly say that I I like the presentation, the points, the goals. They all work well for me, and I think it's a a real uh, good representation of of what we should be looking into in the future. So uh, it's well done, and I'm I support it. Sounds good. I, I thought I might have heard someone else in there, but I'm not sure. So speak now. Chair, that might have been me. I was going to make a closing comment on one point. Oh, go ahead and make that closing comment then, Paul. Well, I just wanted to uh, respond to Dr. Zako's comments about public involvement, and Kelly did touch on this. But as you know, we've had uh, public input, quite a bit of public input on the draft goals discussion that started back in July. And uh, as we've developed those goals, we, we certainly heard over several months from the public. And 
both those goals and these objectives are just drafts. What we wanted to do was get these drafts in place with your input to then start that real extensive outreach next week. As Kelly said, we will have an online open house that will be publicized next week. You'll get an email about that. It'll be online for quite a while. And that's when we'll also be starting some uh, meetings with specific stakeholder groups. So uh, there will be quite a bit more public outreach now that you've established these as the draft goals and objectives for the public to give input on. Okay. So I think, Paul, are we ready to move on to 6B? And I'm quiet again. Paul, are you there? <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. Uh, that was my fault. <laughs> Oh. Oh. Okay, oh. I'm here, sound, and I believe we are ready like to move to 6B. You're making me and sound like I'm totally lost it. <laughs> Golly. Well, if I may, the next time our chair gets lost like that, just let him be lost for a little while longer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Wait till I see you at El Rapa, Joe. <laughs> I won't be there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, Paul, let's go ahead and move on. Thank you, Chair. Item 6B before you is a request to hold a public hearing and to have discussion and feedback to staff on a proposed amendment to the Regional Transportation Plan, the RTP, the current adopted version of that plan. Uh, the City of Eugene has requested the amendment that's in your packet to add the uh, North Delta Path proposed project to the RTP's financially constrained bicycle pedestrian project list. The details are in the memo and there is an attached map. The purpose of adding this to the long range plan of the MPO is that that would provide support for a grant that the city of Eugene is applying for to fund construction of the path. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I'd also uh, note that Rob Interfeld from the city of Eugene is available to answer questions on the project itself. What we're asking for today is that you open a public hearing, close that public hearing. Uh, there, we are uh, in the midst of a 30-day public comment period. And after today's uh, discussion, we will come back to you in January with proposed action on the amendment. Okay. Uh, with that said, I will go ahead and open up the public hearing on this amendment to the Regional Transportation Plan. Anyone wish to speak on that subject? from the public is welcome to do so at this time. Hearing no one, I am now closing the public hearing and open this up for discussion. That'd be your cue, Paul. Uh, I'm, I'm not muted this time. And um, <laughs> if there's any discussion, as I indicated, both Rob Interfeld from the city of Eugene and I are available, I'm not seeing any be anybody on the screen raising their hand. So is, uh, sorry, Carl Yeh. Hi, thank you, Paul, and thank you, uh, Chair. I just wanna say as a cyclist, I'm very excited about any extension of the bike plan or uh, bike paths in, uh, in, in the local area. I think it adds to our uh, allure as a local area, but also improves connectivity between all different kinds of transportation. And so that's another thing to think about. It's not just a great thing for cyclists, it's a great thing for anyone, whether for multimodal access to either transit or other parts of the city. Um, so definitely, I, I think it's a great addition. And Mayor Lucy Venice. Thank you so much. I, I just wanted to uh, reinforce the statements that we heard from the public comment about this, which is that this is a part of Eugene in which there was a lot of development of projected new units, 600 units. This uh, path connects those units to a shopping area. And so there are lots of reasons, and there are, this, there are a number of senior citizens that live in that neighborhood also. So there are a lot of people who need a safe place to walk, and there is going to be even more development. And so it would be a great service to that part of Eugene to be able to uh, invest in this um, bike path. 
Thank you, Mayor. And uh, thank you also, Carl. I'll just go ahead and jump in there too, is that I think I think this makes sense to me and, and that I think we should continue our support and then entertain an amendment to that at our next meeting. And I, I'm actually seeing some head nods. Uh, it, any other discussion? We got some general consensus. I, if, uh, if you disagree, please bark out. Great. Uh, thank you, Paul. And um, thank you for the comments, Carl and, and Lucy. So uh, next item, Paul. Thank you, Chair. This is item 6C, the Oregon Transportation Commission 2024-2027 STIP funding scenarios. This is a continuation of a discussion that we've been having for several months now. If you remember at the last meeting, I reported to you that the Oregon Transportation Commission had received information on four funding scenarios and uh, had had an analysis, which I summarized and we discussed at the last meeting around um, the pros and cons or the impacts of those four scenarios on outcomes such as greenhouse gas mitigation, greenhouse gas adaptation, um, safety, and other criteria. At that last meeting of the MPC, I had indicated um, that just the day before that, I had heard from ODOT staff that the OTC would be selecting a preferred scenario, or would not be selecting, I'm sorry, would not be selecting a preferred scenario at the December 1st meeting two days ago. Uh, that changed, and indeed they entered, the OTC entered the meeting on this past Tuesday with um, an agenda item that directed them to select a preferred scenario out of those four scenarios. But in the end, that's not how it played out. Uh, it was a rather lengthy discussion at the OTC meeting on Tuesday, and they went, if you count in total, from four scenarios to eight scenarios in the course of Tuesday. There were two additional scenarios that were posted for the OTC meeting just before the meeting, and then there were two additional scenarios that actually came up during the meeting. Uh, the short version of this is that the OTC did not reach a decision on uh, December 1st on a funding scenario. They directed ODOT staff to bring three more or three scenarios, what they're calling their final three options, to a special meeting of the OTC next Wednesday. So they actually are meeting again um, just one week later. Uh, what I can tell you is that those three scenarios that they have focused in on to discuss and, and presumably select one as the preferred scenario next week, all include significantly increased funding for what the MPC has indicated is its highest priority, the non-highway um, funding category. The differences between the three scenarios that they're now looking at is that um, one of them emphasizes non-highway and the fix-it category, and the fix-it category is the one where the maintenance and, and preservation happens. Another scenario emphasizes the non-highway and the enhanced scenario. The enhanced scenario, remember, is where um, additions are made to the state system, where improvements are made, new, new capacity is added. And then the third scenario, which was the one that really came up during the meeting, uh, brand new just two days ago, and we don't have any information on yet, would try to emphasize, again, the non-highway, increasing funding for non-highway, but try and find a balance between um, the fix-it and the enhance and the safety. Um, frankly, there's, there's quite a few trade-offs that were still being discussed. Uh, I can't really tell you where it's going to go next Wednesday. All I can say is that I'm fairly confident that your priority, the non-highway funding category, is going to receive support in any of those outcomes between those three scenarios. So I'm not really asking for any more input today. I'm not sure that it's really possible for, for you to give that, given that we don't even know what the, the uh, specifics or the outcomes um, of that third scenario are yet. ODOT's supposed to have that produced later today or tomorrow. But I just wanted to give you an update on that, and I will monitor the meeting next week. Okay. Um, time for discussion, Paul, or do you have more? 
No, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Again, I, I'm sorry I can't give you a more conclusive report. Uh, they, they sort of surprised everybody by continuing to a second meeting next week, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, if I, I'm going to go ahead and jump in. I don't see any hands up or I would uh, acquiesce to those folks. But um, I had an opportunity. I, I saw what they came back with on that matrix. You know what I'm talking about, Paul? Yes. So... And it seems like there's a deviation from where this from where this um, committee was was sitting compared to what they interpreted it or changed things up. And I would like to just reiterate very strongly reiterate where our this committee sent up their recommendations and where we supported and uh, send that back to the OTC and, and remind them this is where we're at as opposed to. Uh, not saying anything and letting things get um, uh, diversified to the point of where they get um, no clear boundaries and, and, and their own interpretations. I think we need to reiterate our our commitment to the, the non-highway systems. Chair, I am happy to take that direction if the committee directs me to do that and submit comment to the OTC for their meeting next Wednesday to continue prioritizing increased funding for non-highway. Yes, and I, and I, went, uh, uh, I figured that would stimulate some comments. So uh, Lucy's, Lucy, and then I have Sean after Lucy. Go ahead, Lucy. Uh, you know, just a quick one. You know, I feel a little bit at sea on this because uh, Chair is referring to a matrix. I don't have that matrix in front of me or know exactly what that looks like. Is that, Paul, do you have it in form that you could put, share a screen or? Can we can we actually see what that looks like, uh, Mayor? Actually, if if the members continue the discussion for another three minutes or so, I am trying to bring that up on my end right now, and then I will share my screen. That would be great. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I should have asked that. Thanks, Lucy. And um, Sean, go ahead. You can burn out three minutes. <laughs> yeah. How long can I tell, tell tell a story to keep Joe entertained for three minutes? I got a timer no, going, Sean. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm supportive of right, that us sending up additional comments and reinforcing. I think where the where the committee's at. Um, I think it's interesting that they've got additional scenarios. Um, but like when when you sort of describe them, it sort of tweaks to the to the current the current scenarios. And I have seen the matrix. I know that Paul's looking for it. Um, as far as what those alternatives are. Um, but I don't think those alternatives speak to where we think the need is. And I think just continuing to reiterate our support for uh, the non-highway system would become critical. How much more time do I have? Do I have a time to tell a long winded story? You've got a minute and 52 seconds. Keep rolling. Nah. <laughs> Good. Hey, I see Betty's hand up. So Betty, go ahead and unmute yourself and speak, please. Thank you. I just wanted to say that I strongly agree with Commissioner Pishinari. That's all. That's a, that's the third time she has in this year and I'm impressed. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to miss you, Betty. Um, Joe, followed by Mayor Smith. I wanted to be able to speak before we know what we're talking about. So I wanted to uh, to add that 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 I agree with um, with Betty Taylor, as I always tend to on this particular item <laughs> regarding Mr. Pishinary. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. I may have misinterpreted what Betty said. She was maybe agreeing with what you said, but not me. Um, Mayor Smith, go ahead. I, I just want to say I agree. I, I think it would be worthwhile to reiterate what we sent forward and make sure it doesn't get diluted down the road. So I certainly agree that we should send another statement. Thank you, Mayor. And I have uh, Commissioner Sorensen. Go right ahead, sir. Thanks. You know, maybe it's my last meeting that has brought people together, but I agree with uh, Councillor Taylor and uh, Councillor Pishinary. I sure like that. It, it has to be that, it's that right juju. Okay. Yeah. It has to be, Commissioner Sorensen has to be correct. That That is the reason. That's right. Thank you, Joe. As usual, my meetings kind of go a little sideways, but you know we can't say we haven't been having fun. All right. Uh, so, Carl, go ahead. 
Oh, since we're still killing time, I just want to say me too, bro. Chair, uh, I do have it well, ready. Yes, that, save me, please. Uh, so I'm going to start sharing my screen here. And can people see this now? Yes, see it very well, thanks. Okay, so what I have in front of you is one of the many slides that was presented two days ago to the OTC. I'll start with this and then I'm gonna show you one other slide. The leftmost four scenarios, scenarios one, two, three, and four, are the four scenarios that I showed you last month after the October OTC meeting and that we discussed how non-highway here, scenario two had done very well in their analysis across these criteria and you continue to support that. During the meeting, uh, the December 1st OTC meeting two days ago, they introduced uh, really these two scenarios and then these two scenarios during the, you know, during the meeting. Um, and what you see here is, I'm gonna focus in over on these last three. Scenario 2A, as I mentioned, was a balance, uh, an attempt to balance non-highway and enhance um, with, you can see um, some reduction to fix it, and you can see how much enhance is improved and how much enhance is improved here. These percentages I wanna to talk to in a minute are a little misleading. I'll talk to that in a minute. And then hybrid three came up as a way to try and get um, some, safety prioritization along with the non-highway, uh, but also you'll see 400% increase for enhance. And again, I wanna to speak to those percentages in a minute. Don't be misled by that large number necessarily. It's a little difficult to talk about hybrid three because they sort of dismissed hybrid three and then directed staff to develop hybrid 3A which is the one that ODOT is supposed to develop by the end of today or perhaps tomorrow. So what they're coming back to meet again next week is to discuss 2A, 2B, and 3A, which is not shown here. Now I wanna to go to a second slide, uh, if I can, quickly, because I talked about how those percentages can be misleading, and they are just because you have to consider the base you're starting from. So for instance, I'll start with that large 400% increase for enhanced, but notice that you're starting from only a base of 24 million. So the 400% increase is only an increase of 100 million for enhanced, and yet an 86% increase in non-highway is an increase of 150 million. Mm -hmm. So even in that scenario where it looks like, wait a minute, they might be prioritizing enhanced or the, if you will, new capacity, it's really still, under this scenario, supporting on highway with more dollars. I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does to me. Is there another chart uh, for those of you who may have seen one that I should try and highlight? Those I think are the two that sort of best illustrate where they left it two days ago. Do I see any hands anywhere? Oh, I got Mayor Venice, go ahead. So just a question because Chair, you commented on this and so did Sean about this, these new scenarios maybe not aligning with our, uh, with our, com our previous comments and directions. So I'm just wondering if, if you would say what it is that's in your mind that maybe doesn't align, but what's your concern? Here. I'm sorry, I was trying to find that microphone. Well, I, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, I guess maybe the percentages had me a little bit perplexed, but I just wanted to make sure that when we had um, when public comment was given to the committee is that it seemed like the committee was drifting away from where our priorities were set and that, you know, we had, we were very clear on what our priorities were. And if you look at all these hybrids, and they seem to be deviating, not, not a little bit, but quite a bit from where we were at. And I just wanted to make sure that 
that we wanted to send a resounding voice and we don't want deviation from this. This is truly what we want. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me. I just, I, so what I'm taking away, I, yeah, I just want to make sure I'm understanding what your what concerns might be here in the committee. And I do think the explanation of the percentages is enlightening because it is a little alarming when you just look at the percentages themselves. It looks like, oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 No, I get so, that. And actually, Paul, yeah. that, that brings it to point too, is that perhaps the, uh, mm -hmm. the structure of the matrix could be clarified by using those numbers. And I hate throwing more and more data into some sort of chart or matrix, matrix but it's it's clear that, you know, 75% of $100 or $100 million is 75 million, but 75% um, of $300 million is a lot more, you know, so I get that. And I, I think if maybe the, the way the matrix is put together can be clarified just a little bit to help us if that's, I think that's what you're saying too, Lucy, isn't it? Yeah. Chair, if I may. Go, go right ahead. Frankly, your, uh, your points and some of the other points being made about uh, the clarity of the matrix, the use of percentages versus the, versus the use of the dollars were comments that OTC members themselves were saying on Tuesday to ODOT staff that they were having trouble following and understanding some of the significance and magnitudes of these uh, changes of, of across the scenarios. Uh, these, these charts I'm showing you are the ODOT scenarios, the ODOT slides that were presented to OTC. Um, and, you know, one of the other things I want to mention in terms of talking about how it may vary from our priority. Again, NPC has consistently emphasized that the non-hybrid category is its top priority. And as you can see under uh, these scenarios, and again, 2A, 2B, and a new 3A are the ones that still seem to be in play. Non-highway does fairly well, if not quite well, in, in dollar amounts across these. One of the things that has changed, though, is that uh, these non are these enhanced dollars under these three are more than either this hybrid one, which would have zeroed out even that 24 million of enhanced, or if I can for a minute, going back here, um, you know, some of these other earlier scenarios didn't have much in the way of enhanced dollars either. So one of the reasons that was explained to the OTC why the ODOT staff felt that it was important to at least have this amount of support in the enhanced category was because what happened with HB 2017, going all the way back to that, was the legislature earmarked certain projects and earmarked funds for certain projects. And, and those projects were, you know, capacity increasing or enhanced projects, if you will, predominantly in the Portland metropolitan area, such as Rose Quarter, Highway 205, and a tolling project for one of the 205 bridges. But the legislature did not earmark enough money. The, the, the legislature did not provide enough money to fully complete those projects. And what this amount of money does, according to ODOT, is allow the tolling project, for instance, to actually get off the ground and allow some of those other projects to come closer to being fully funded. So that's really what they were trying to do with this relatively small increment in terms of you know, modernization or enhanced type projects. That's really what they were trying to accomplish here. I hope that helps. Uh, it helps me for sure. So I think I, um, I think I'm still at where I was mentioned earlier about just sending up, sending a letter, reinforcing where we're at, understanding that that those hybrids aren't quite so radical as I, at least I interpreted them, them as. But I think a reiteration would be important. So if, uh, as far as I, I see, uh, Councillor Van Gordon's microphone's on and off. I, I agree. Like I, I think just stating where where um, kind of where we're at and trying to reinforce our opinion sort of matters. And I know that some of these are being fleshed out a little bit more and may get us close to the pin as well. But you know, us giving comments never a bad thing. Good, thank you. Go ahead, Joe. I don't know what is required to um, to move forward because I've heard every member say that they've agreed with that statement. Um, so not only do I agree, but I think in the cluster of multiple scenarios, um, 
it's always good to restate our priorities and understand how those priorities affect um, final outcomes and where we will have a chance to input as this moves forward. So I completely agree. Do we need a motion or are head nods good enough, Paul? I believe, a, well, Paul, maybe it would be um, stronger if we indicated our reiteration by a vote that's indicated on that letter that by unanimous vote or by consensus, what do you think? Chair, I'm comfortable either way. What I will say is that you have uh, repeatedly supported that that scenario on uh, highway receiving priority for increased funding, and I'm comfortable emphasizing that with or without a motion. The other thing I want to add is that I probably will not actually submit a letter. The only re there's two reasons for that. Number one, uh, the deadline for submitting a letter for it to get into the uh, hard copy packet for the meeting is coming up very soon and they haven't actually released the details on scenario 3a that new scenario what i will do because this is also an option if it's okay with you is i will sign up to give testimony at the start of the meeting next wednesday and that's possible with these virtual meetings um, you can sign up and i have the ability to do that with odot uh, staff and I will testify orally to what MPC is directing today. That will allow me to see the information that's actually published for the meeting and make sure that I can address that specifically and emphasize again, your continuing support for prioritizing non-highway funding. I think that's a great idea. Do I have agreement with the board? Kind of heads up, I got thumbs, everything. Anybody uh, disagree, please speak up. I just would like to make sure Paul knows everybody's behind us. All right. Thank you, Paul. That's a great idea. And um, I think that'd be probably more effective anyway. It, so, it probably will be because their, their right. uh, packet two days ago had 200 pages of public input. Right. And that's like what we get at council and Betty knows and Mayor Venice knows, everybody else knows that we get two to 600 pages on a Thursday and need to talk about it on a Monday. So uh, that being said, I don't, don't want to beat this horse too badly, like uh, Joe implied. Um, Let's move forward. You got enough from us, Paul, I'm pretty sure. Yes, I do, thank you. All right, uh, let's move forward with the uh, next steps and ODOT update. Hi, Franny Brindle here. Hi, I've Franny. Got a couple, I got a couple <laughs> things to talk to you about. One is the Safe Routes to School grants that were just um, awarded yesterday at the OTC meeting. And the second, I wanna share a little bit about public involvement that we received public input on our project on 126 West that connects Eugene to Venita and onto the coast. So first off, the Safe Routes to School Awards were granted for 21-22, and we were winners in this uh, MPO for sure. Howard, um, City of Eugene applied, has two applications that were approved, Howard Elementary for 447,000, almost 448, and they were also allowed to reduce their match to 20%. That project would um, do rapid flashing beacons, crossing islands, crosswalk markings for Prairie Mountain School. Um, then Springfield also has a, a rapid flashing beacon pet island for Douglas Elementary School for 320,000, also at a reduced match of 20%. And Lane County was awarded a project for Lundy Elementary School, a big one, $931, almost $32,000, and a reduced match of 20%. And that's for sidewalks and ped refuge, pedestrian refuge island. Um, so that's all great news for those schools and those communities. Congratulations to those that applied. Um, and then on the... Uh, we just, so as you know, there was a House Bill 2017 project to do um, the NEPA work and uh, preliminary design for Highway 126 West between Eugene and Benita. And that's been going on um, now for about six months. And we've done quite a lot of uh, public involvement. And I wanted to kind of share a little bit about what we heard back from the communities. And it's important for us at the MPO because this community, again, is connected to Venita. There's some commuters that go back and forth. 
And then also this area goes to the coast a lot. So um, we did three constituency meetings um, held in August and the groups were highway users, pedestrians, bicyclists, boaters, environmentalists, hunters, and fishermen or fisher people. And then what we got support for is a four lane alternative with a multi-use path. Um, there was concern about access and turning for business trucks and emergency vehicles on the highway. They want um, a complete design to be presented to them with safe connections and uh, for road crossings and their concerns about project impact to fish, wildlife and plants. They want to make sure they can they have access to recreational opportunities as well. There was also an online open house held in September through the COVID. We had a high response rate of about 750 individuals that um, joined the open house and 325 folks responded to the survey despite the fires going on. Um, there were support, again, support for the four lane with the multi-use path, uh, intersection safety, desire to maintain access to the natural areas, and they wanted to extend the project limits to territorial highway. And they all felt there was a sense of urgency around this project. So. I, would, I will continue to bring to you public comments as I hear them. Um, Beltline was another one that we did a lot of outreach for so that you're sure that you're hearing from the community that's using these highway facilities that are on the state system. Thank you. Thank you, Franny. And I have uh, Mayor Venice, go ahead. So just a question, so this would be four lanes that would also go across that section of Fern Ridge Reservoir. Correct. Yeah, and so we have a highly constrained area between the reservoir and the, the railroad, the Coos Bay Rail. Right. Yeah, so that sounds tricky and very, I mean, it would be, that's a, that's a pretty fragile ecosystem right there for four lanes plus bike, right? How wide does that end up being? Well, it would be um, two lanes and a potential, you know, middle, probably not a center turn lane, more of a, uh, probably a barrier between. Um, and just so you know, this would be a great, a very expensive project. We're talking upwards of over $200 million. Wow. And so most likely how it would be played out if construction money was um, obtained, mostly through a build grant or something like that, would be in phases. Um, and maybe, you know, there would be phases from west to east or east to west. We're not sure how that would play out. Um, but the alternatives that the engineers are looking at are minimizing to the greatest extent the impacts to the reservoir. And just so you know, the Army Corps of Engineers um, are involved in the the uh, project as well. They are commenting. They're you know intricately involved in looking at the minimization of and the mitigation of impacts. But good okay. question. And I and I'd like to also you know kind of I actually kind of reiterate what um, Lucy's concerns too is that you have that Coyote Creek uh, Coyote Creek wildlife area that's heavily used by not just hunters, but by a lot of folks walking dogs in open spaces, um, a lot of kids going out there, et cetera. So there's a lot of traffic coming in out of there. Plus you have activity to the south of West 11th or Route F of the additional wildlife area. I can't, the name escapes me right at the top of my head. Um, and then you have fishermen who, fisher persons, that, um, that I'm not sure if you ever watched them, but I have working back in the day with the sheriff's office, whatnot, they they frequently cross that road as the sun changes and shadows change, casting into that water. So their uh, fishing ability or the, the fishing effectiveness changes as the day proceeds. So you've had a lot of foot traffic. And when you go to start widening that out, and especially if you're entertaining a center median that may prohibit or slow down the ability for them to escape the traffic, um, I can see that, that um, that's a huge, that would be a huge concern for me because I would not want to um, have a, that road negatively impact that that 
very important recreational activity. Um, and then thirdly, on a safety aspect, once you start opening that up and creating those, that, those fast lanes, so to speak, I can tell you from past experience that that is a straightaway that was commonly used for very high speed traffic that, you know, unlawfully high speed. And when you go to open that up, and you put in some meridians in there that that offer protection for that activity because of law enforcement unable to address that immediately um, you're going to increase the, the likelihood of, of very serious accidents there and with that as mayor venice is talking about with that uh, with accidents occurring there you're going to look at a high incidence or high potential of spillage into that waterway of those haz hazardous materials from those vehicles so um I, I don't envy whoever's looking at that. That's that's a that is a, a ton of I can see, and a, a very famous attorney I've, I've spent a lot of time, which her name escapes me, is always says if it's predictable, it's preventable, and a lot of these things are very predictable. So good luck, and and well, I'm looking forward to seeing how that progresses if it does, because I think you're going to be up against a lot of of, of argument there. Yeah, and I, I, just, I, I, just, I just want to make one other comment. I mean, we're just looking at our RTP and our objectives and our priorities, and and we just talked about the STIP and non-highway investment, and I'm thinking this is a project that's going to extend for decades in the future by the time you get the money together and the engineering and everything else. And, and it just feels to me like if commuting is the issue, then it feels to me like transit is the solution that doesn't require building a lot more highway and then the highway remains for people who are using it not on a regular sort of schedule where they need buses so i guess i don't know if that's been in the conversation but i would think given the conversations we're having as an npc that you, you know in and that public engagement um i mean I, i'm just a little concerned about i guess i just echo what what the chair has just said about sort of exploring the feasibility and the challenges of this, but it also seems to me kind of flies in the face of our other priorities to be talking about a $200 million highway project. Thank and you, I, Lucy. And I, I see Betty, your turn, Betty, go ahead. Here's, there it is. I was there, clicking there on the go. wrong. I was clicking on the wrong thing. You're welcome. <laughs> um, yes, thank you. I just want to say I agree with the mayor that um, between here and Vanita, probably transit is the thing. I, I, a few years ago, I was riding my bike to Vanita. It's you could ride a bicycle. A bike lane would be good, but uh, public transit would be good, and rail if that's possible. But I think a problem now, I drive at least a few times a year to the coast on 126 and the biggest problem is speeders and more lanes would probably increase the speed. I was I was once stopped because I was driving the speed limit not, and not speeding. And the, the police officer told me that it frustrated people if people didn't go fast. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Do I have any more uh, questions, comments? And Franny, did you have any more? I think you actually finished up on yours. Yeah, I did, and I appreciate your comments. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, Joe, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I strongly agree with Mayor Venice and Chair Pichonieri. So I'm just curious, Franny, when you get input like this from a body like this, how does that impact? the discussion and planning moving forward on a project such as this? Um, I take the input that I hear from this body and share it with the body that's involved in the input for the general project. So we have a um, steering committee, if you will, um, which is represented by um, City of Eugene, Benita. Um, there's a member on the coast. There's a, a rail constituent. LTD, Lane County, um, you know, they've heard this public comment. I gather the public comment from this body. We're, you know, I'm welcome 
if you would like, we could have a presentation from um, the project management uh, to this body if you'd be interested and we can have that discussion. Um, I'm open to that for sure. Since this community and the city of Benita would be you know, affected. I know that there's a lot of desire from the city of Benita for a project like this. Um, so there's been concern about safety and crossing and all of that, so. I see, uh, thank you, Franny. And I see uh, Sean, Councilor Van Gordon, followed by Mayor Smith. Um, I'd be interested in seeing a presentation about it. Um, and I would be uh, like just listening to the conversation. Maybe I'm one step or two steps back from that. I'd be curious to learn more. But like th that's a, you know, Benin is its own separate community, right? Like, and this is probably a pretty important project to them. So I would be hesitant to, um, inflict judgment on what transportation choices impact that area without learning a little bit more, especially since they're not at the table here. Right. Thank you. That's good Thank input. You. Thank you, Sean. I have Mayor Smith followed by Commissioner Sorensen. All right. I have uh, children and grandchildren that live in the Venita and Elmira areas and uh, our family partakes of the wetland areas and birding and kayaking and boating and everything else around there. And uh, being a former medic that used to respond out into that area all the time, it's, uh, I think safety is just the biggest thing that stands out. Uh, traffic most of the time seems to move fairly well along there, but the safety and the conflict between the recreational aspects and, and the travel are just huge events there. And and I hear that from my kids all the time who are in their 30s and 40s now. And, and uh, they like using that lake, but it's, it's such a hazard to be around that highway and to do anything. As Commissioner Pishonary pointed out, or Councilor Pishonary, uh, it's, it's the safety issue of it, not so much increasing to four lanes and having higher volume and higher speeds because the speed issue is certainly something that I can attest to after 25 years of responding out there in ambulances and, and fire engines. So uh, I think that needs to be uh, a real relevant issue. And I think the, the uh, residents of the Bonita area do have that issue that, that safety is a big part of it, but they also use those recreational aspects and put some priority on that. Thank you, Mayor Smith, and I have Commissioner Sorensen. Go ahead, Pete. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to uh, ask a question and make a comment. And the question is, um, you know, the uh, MPC jurisdiction is mostly, as I understand it, uh, allocation of federal transportation dollars within the uh, planning area. That's mostly the Eugene Springfield Coburg uh, planning area. Uh, and uh, is this within the planning area? Commissioner, Brenda and I were just discussing that this project is actually outside of the MPO boundary at this time. Um, that said, while you may not have any um, say over the funding or direct input because it is outside of the boundary, it has been noted that it could affect residents or employees, employers within the MPO. and. Part of the federal charge of the MPO is to coordinate and, and um, you know, plan for transportation needs to and from the MPO. So I wouldn't say it's completely outside of the purview of the MPO, but geographically it is. Well, uh, that leads me to my comment. And it's something that I, I worked on several years ago and I'll just bring up now so that those of you that are continuing on MPC can think about this in the future. But, um, I testified before the uh, Oregon State Senate Transportation Committee on the topic of uh, eliminating what I consider to be the duplication between the state's um, uh, committees that they've set up in counties around the state to advise them on uh, allocation of state transportation dollars and the, uh, and the uh, uh, duplication in staff and services and the very precious number of volunteers, not 
people like me and Joe that get paid, but volunteers like uh, our, our friends, the Springfield counselors and the mayor of Coburg and the many, many other people that are volunteers that serve in elective office. And my suggestion was for those counties that have uh, a federally uh, MP, M, um, MPOs um, where they're allocating federal transportation dollars, that they not duplicate um, the uh, precious time of all these volunteers or dilute the time of these volunteers. Uh, and um, and uh, I might add that suggestion was not taken. <laughs> that suggestion was totally rejected, which is why we have a duplicate system in my view uh, in Lane County. And that's the reason I asked the question because I already knew the answer. It was outside the MPO and uh, yet, uh, it will take up the time of our uh, rural and our urban elected officials. And it'd be better just to have one big happy family to fight these things out on the allocation of state and federal resources. Um, but uh, that's not the way it is. So we have two. And I mentioned earlier that the Board of Commissioners will be allocating uh, the uh, commissioner's assignments to various committees. And I'm sure uh, now that Commissioner uh, uh, Bernie is completing his second full year on the board. He can recognize that, you know, there's only five commissioners. And if we have uh, 35 committees to allocate, that's seven per only in the case of outgoing Commissioner Sorensen. He won't take seven. He'll only take five. So that means that's how many more for other people to take. And I just think it's unreasonable. And I think that it's a proliferation of uh, governments that are not needed. And I think it builds... Uh, negative uh, public opinion of government when they build so many different structures that are so hard to understand. So that's just my two cents worth. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Sorensen. Appreciated those comments. Um, I think it looks like that's about it for you, Franny. Yeah, could I just add one thing? And I, I also wanted Rob to weigh in if he wanted to, Rob Interfeld. Um, the project does connect into Eugene, and Eugene is looking at Green Hill Road as well as an intersection that would feed into this area. Um, and the other thing I wanted to respond to Mayor Venice is that um, the LTD, the, the um, bus and transit use is also being considered. Um, in, a pre in a previous project, we did some intersection improvements toward Benita and bus pullouts uh, that you might notice. Um, and then we have a project that right now, uh, Green Hill Road up to up into the Beltline that will make improvements to the um, bus stop there at Green Hill and 126. And as you know, the West Eugene MX ends and terminates at the Walmart there, which makes it a really good um, place where people can transfer and collect commuters from that Vanita area. So I very much hope to see transit use increase as we provide these facilities on this um, on this uh, corridor, um, which um, L the LCOG has been helping us with as well for uh, transit service increases in this area. And Rob, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I'll just add that um, I serve on the steering committee along with city councilor elect Randy Groves and uh, as Franny pointed out, the project starts at Terry Street in West Eugene. So there is a chunk of the project that is within the MPO. And that section of, it's also West 11th Avenue is really, uh, doesn't have any facilities for people walking or biking. Um, you know, I think it's an interesting conversation about, do you go to four lanes or not? And the facility plan that was developed several years ago already has that in it. So it would be interesting to have a conversation at the MPC about changing that, but it feels like if we are gonna to go to four lanes, we probably should start at Terry rather than having it narrow down and then get wider again. And um, also this, we've requested that ODOT consider a roundabout at the intersection of Terry and Green Hill, that that would really, part of the issue in the corridor is just the speeds. And so anything we can do to bring the speeds down will make it safer. And if there are crashes, they will be less likely to be fatal or serious injury crashes. And I think it's just really challenging to bring speeds down in a corridor like this when you don't, when you don't have a lot of intersections. So uh, hopefully the designers can come up with some ideas for how to do that, or the engineers, I should say. 
that's all, that's all I have to say. Oh, one other thing, Franny, when you mentioned earlier about the Sip Roots School Grants, I uh, just wanted to clarify, there were two in Eugene, one yeah, on the, in the Eugene School District, and then, in, then the one with the cross, the pedestrian crossings, crossings is actually in the Bethel School District, and they will serve Perry Mountain School, and they're on Danebo and Royal Street, those two streets. Right. Howard and Prairie Mountain is right. what I have. Yeah. And then one more thing, the result of what we're doing here with this, this design concept design is getting public comment and looking at the environmental, socioeconomic, all sorts of impacts on a conceptual level design. We will bring that and share that. Um, and Fern Ridge Reservoir does account for about 25% of the total length of highway. Um, and, and it has not been decided what the, the preferred concept will be when it's all said and done. It's still being worked out. Thank you. Thank you, Franny. So um, I think there's plenty of information and questions back and forth on that. And, and let us know if there's something else that you want from this from this committee. <laughs> all right, moving on. Uh, so uh, what's uh, next steps in, a, in the agenda build, Paul? Yeah, just noting in your packet are the uh, administrative amendments to the transportation improvement program. Uh, again, if there's any comments or questions on those, please let us know. The next meeting is scheduled for January 7th, and we're now planning on continued virtual meetings. Okay. Any questions regarding the uh, MTIP amendments? They look good to me, Paul. Thank you. I don't see any hands up. So uh, on that note, I want to thank everybody for being here today and sharing your time with us. And everyone, please be well, be safe. And until next time, take care.